magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent and this is the unit focus video on Shining Spears. In these videos I talk about what the unit is, what it's for on the table, obstacles to using it well, and methods for overcoming those obstacles and also whatever else I think of. So we're going to do this with spears today, but before we do, a quick disclaimer for those veteran tournament players who regularly run luminous space elf lancers in your competitive lists. I don't think I have anything especially new to tell you. Occasionally in these unit focus videos, I have a trick or two to share that I hope might be a revelation even to highly competitive demographics that already know a great deal about the unit in question. But I don't think this is one of those. So if you are some kind of busy horse dentist who already knows everything there is to know about space elf melee cavalry, continue with the understanding that I might not have anything more to offer than occasional one-liners about Monkai fashion sense or something. Oh, also at the end of the video, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a free app called Voxlink that's coming next month that will make it easier for 40 player, 40k forty players to find one another. I'm pretty excited about it. So that's, that's a thing at the end. Uh, okay, here we go. So Shining Spears are Aspect Shock Cavalry, uh, Gallant Lancers, that surge across the battlefield at key moments to exploit weaknesses in the enemy defenses or to trade themselves for one or more enemy units in order to eliminate key assets or flip an objective or whatever. Used well, they can be a valuable asset in just about any list and they have multiple highly competitive builds, which is cool. That's not always true of units. In all of those builds, the star of the squad is invariably the Exarch who in a minimum sized unit, uh, usually, so three models, the Exarch usually accounts for at least 50% of the damage output. And I would definitely suggest running spears in minimum sized units for reasons that I will get to later in the video. Now, before we dive into tactics, I think it's worth acknowledging that one compelling non-tactical reason to include spears in a list is quite simply that the models are gorgeous. Uh, like all of the best newer GW fast attack models, the new spears look like they're whipping across the ruined landscape of a 40k battlefield with their pennants thrumming in the wind. And we waited a long time for these models. Uh, when spears were first introduced back in the second edition codex, there were literally no sculpts for them. They, they were just a concept. Uh, you had to like buy wind riders, which looked sort of rigid and like they were wearing 19th century double-breasted cavalry uniforms and put like lance arms on them. Um, just as there were no models for Exodite, Dragon, Riders, and Space Elf Pirates and other things that appeared in that book. When we did finally get sculpts back in third edition, they looked like chunky French knights lining up for a joust with none of the dynamic speed suggested by the newer models. And those third ed models were the models until like a year ago, not even. Now, I'm sure it was for these reasons that before the new kit dropped, Spears were probably the most commonly kit-bashed craft worlders in the entire Eldari line. And the design of the new models was definitely informed by 40K enthusiasts who were kit-bashing their own Shining Spears. And I, th I think that's cool. That sort of back and forth dialogue between designers and players, I think is, is really neat. Uh, I think you can see this in that adding dire avenger heads to wind riders was like one of the most popular high-end way to make shining spears for those with serious funds to throw it cannibalizing other kits to incorporate like one element into a model uh and you get lances for warhammer fantasy or, or whatever and the the scrub brush helmet on top of the kit bash wind riders were objects of awe on pinterest and that new look has been picked up for the new design, which is neat. And it's also more consistent with the rest of the the Eldar models, which generally have a very slate Greco-Trojan Eastern vibe, which makes aesthetic sense in a universe in which the Eldari Empire preceded the Romano-influenced Imperium, just as the Greeks preceded the Romans. And we know that the Imperium can't help but admire the Eldari's technological achievements while nevertheless disdaining the Mazinos Barbarians, which is also kind of the Roman attitude towards the Greeks. So that's cool. More on that sort of thing when I do my videos on the aesthetic roots of 40k and craft worlders in general. For now, we'll move on to stats and builds, and then we'll talk tactics. So 
Shining Spears are the only aspect warriors potent in both the shooting and close combat phases of the game. The standard loadout for each non Exarch model is Twin Link Shuriken Catapults and a Laser Lance. In the shooting phase, the Laser Lance is Assault 1, Strength 6, minus 4 AP, flat 2 damage, which is pretty good. And incidentally, those are the same stats as the melee profile when the unit charges, although with an attack characteristic of 3, Spears hit harder on the charge than in the shooting phase. The XR can also upgrade the Twin Linked Shuriken Catapults to a Shuriken Cannon for free and optionally pay 10 points to upgrade the Laser Lance to a Star Lance, which has the same profile, but it's Strength 8. Alternatively, you could, at no cost, swap the Laser Lance for a Paragon Saber, which is only Strength 4 and only does 1 damage, but is still minus 4 AP, it grants an extra attack, and it enables the XR to reroll all hits and all wounds. Now, that might nevertheless sound like a dodgy deal at one damage and with the lesser strength, but with the right Exarch upgrade, it really isn't, and I will get to that in a minute. As with other aspects, the Exarch has one more attack than the regular elves in the unit, but if you give the Exarch an Exarch power, and you should, the attack character characteristic goes to a five, uh, six with the Paragon Saber, because that also gives plus one attack, in addition to the other benefits associated with the selected bonus, the Exarch power that, that you chose. Uh, like all elf bikes, Shining Spears have a 16-inch move and automatically count as having rolled a 6 when they make an advance move. On the durability front, they are moderately robust against small arms fire with a native minus 1 to hit, toughness 4, 2 wounds, and a 5 plus plus and vulnerable save. The Exarch, however, if upgraded, has 4 wounds and for five points can take a Shimmer Shield, bumping the Envolm for that model to a four plus, and it is for those reasons that some players refer to their Shining Spear Exarch as a baby Autarch, with a couple of bodyguards there to provide ablative wounds. I think that this uh, quippy characterization doesn't actually give enough credit to the combat value of the other two models, but it isn't totally wrong either. Opponents unfamiliar with Spears will be surprised how hard the Exarch hits and how hard it is to eliminate relative to other models in the unit. The perception that the 9th edition spears are all about the Exarch is further reinforced by the fact that when adding this unit to a list, the only significant decisions you actually make are around the squad leader, right? The loadout for the standard members of the squad is fixed, and although you could theoretically add up to three additional bike elves, taking the whole squad to six, I would advise against it. Uh, for one thing, like Shroud Runners, the new Shining Spear Sculpts have significantly larger bases than the old models, which makes hiding them out of line of sight considerably more difficult than it was before. Also, Spears will, at least in highly competitive play, often be a one-and-done trading unit, so you need to keep the cost of the squad low, uh, or you're likely to end up without any valuable trades in lost matchups. So if you're putting a bunch of extra models in there, Spears get really expensive really fast, and then it's just very difficult to uh, attack anything and then have them not be vulnerable to a counterattack and not end up with a bad trade, right? And just in case anybody out there is thinking that you can get around this by running the old sc sculpts with the small bases, uh, in matched play, you, you cannot, in, in competitive matched play. Sure, at your local club, like, where people are playing very casually, um, you're unlikely to get called out in very casual play on not having the most up-to-date base size for your units, but in circumstances in which it really does, in fact, make a significant tactical difference, I think that even if people aren't calling you on it, it's still it's a little bit disingenuous. Although older models remain legal at all levels of play, the rules for matched play do require that they be rebased to match the base size of the most recent sculpt. So... If you are sitting on a dozen dated spears, like most of us are, that look like the flower of French chivalry standing at attention, you can't competitively capitalize on their small base size. What you can do is buy new flying bases directly from GW, or uh, you can get magnetized versions from my sponsor, the Magnet Baron, um, and those are pretty cool too. Uh, the real point here is that the whether you're using older new models, um, you're better off sticking with the standard squad of three which means the only loadout decisions you, you're making with reference to squad construction are all about the Exarch. So first off, you need to decide whether to take the cannon 
or the twin link shuriken catapults. I think you pretty much always want the cannon for zero points. The only situation in which the catapults are better is when the squad makes a 22 inch advance move and so then isn't going to charge but it's still in range to shoot something as the whole unit could still fire with both the catapults and the lances because those are both assault weapons while the heavy keyword on the cannon would prevent you from shooting after advancing with the unit unless you're running a custom craft world with swift strikers and then you would never want the catapults ever under any circumstances really uh i guess if you were shooting gaunts or something but the situation i just described where you you make that advanced move and, and you shoot is a really niche circumstance uh it, it it'll happen from time to time but you will almost never commit your spears to battle unless you can also make the charge move with them and uh, unless you're playing Sam Han, there's simply no way to advance a unit of spears and then also charge. So it's possible that with the newly improved rules for behind enemy lines, you know, spears might occasionally make an advance into the opponent's backfield and settle for just shooting. Right. So behind enemy lines, that new secondary. Now, if you just have one unit in your opponent's deployment zone at the end of your turn, you get three points. So if you do it every turn, you can max it out. Right. Uh, and there might be some game in which your spears need to do that because you want those three points. But these outlier situations, are, I think, are too rare to justify taking the catapults over the cannon. Um, there are other ways to score behind enemy lines. And also now that uh, the point cost for Marines has dropped so significantly, the more flat two damage weapons you have in a list, uh, the better. Craft Worlders are really good at killing Marines. So in general, it's not a bad matchup for us. But stuff like Blood Angels, which are fast, can be a real freaking problem. The only difficult loadout question you really face in putting the squad together is whether to select the Paragon Saber or some kind of Lance, and then if a Lance, which one? If you do decide to go with the Saber, you pretty much have to take the Exarch Power Heart Strike, which causes the Exarch's unmodified wound rolls of 5+, plus to do a mortal wound in addition to any other damage. And because the, Ser the Paragon Saber allows its bearer to reroll all hits and all wounds, and because an Exarch with this upgrade has an attack characteristic of five plus an additional one for the extra attack granted by the sword, you stand a pretty good chance of doing three mortal wounds in addition to forcing three or four armor saves at minus four AP. Uh, incidentally, against some targets, it's mathematically savvy to reroll every wound die that is in a five or six in order to fish for more mortals, even if uh, a four would do the trick. It, it's reasonably rare, but it happens this the spear build with the sword is a potent build that sees plenty of play in competitive lists and has the advantage of being 10 points cheaper at least than the upgraded lance at strength eight which is to be fair better than the strength four on the on the saber uh but with the rerolls to hit the saber is probably at least as reliable as the the lesser strength six lance he just sleep if you do decide to go with the Lance build, uh, it's not a bad idea to pay the extra 10 points for the upgraded Lance. I just said the Paragon Saber is 10 points cheaper. It's 10 points cheaper than the upgraded Lance, not than the standard Star Lance. Um, but it's not a bad idea if you are taking a Lance to pay an extra 10 points to take the Lance from Strength 6 to Strength 8, both shooting and on the charge. It's not compulsory. The squad will still be a serious threat and do real damage without it. And adding the Lance on top of the competitively necessary Exarch upgrade will take the squad from 105 points to 135 points. It's 140 if you add the shield in. Um, at 135, it's really right around where advantageous trading becomes increasingly touch and go. Um, that said, if you can spare the extra 10 points with five attacks on the Exarch at strength eight instead of strength six, plus that one shooting attack, the damage output goes up by an average. Obviously, it depends on what you're targeting, but of about three wounds, which is pretty solid. Uh, as for which Exarch power to select when you're doing a lance build instead of a sword build, before Arcs of Omen dropped, I would have categorically recommended Expert Lancers every time, which for 20 points gives all the models in the squad plus one to hit on the charge, cutting in half the number of times they miss in melee if there's no penalty to hit the opponent, so they're hitting on twos. Uh, and this is still a very strong pick and probably my own preference. That said, now that the secondary objective behind enemy lines scores you three points for a single unit and your enemy de enemy's deployment zone, I just talked about this, uh, the Exarch Power Lightning Attacks also has potential. 
It allows the unit to make a six inch consolidation move instead of the usual three. I think this is probably in here with the idea that if you were running a big unit of spears, you'd want to be able to get all of them in. And this is like their concession to the larger base size, but I actually don't think that's the way to use it at all. Um, if you can use that six inch consolidation move, plus your follow-up move, if you wipe the, the enemy, you, you may be able to move the spears from the like beginning of the midfield into your enemy's deployment zone to help you reliably score behind enemy lines. Uh, and that could be pretty powerful as a scoring tool. In general, I think you're better off just having more reliable, reliable tactics for scoring behind enemy. There are other ways to do that and doubling down on your spears as killers with expert lancers. But I can certainly see the argument for lightning attacks now, especially in the hands of a top shelf competitive player. But I think most of us are going to do better with expert lancers. The last war gear option to consider is the shimmer shield, which, oh, one other thing, uh, the models you're seeing on the screen, the, the unit with the standard lances, uh, that's, a, that's, that's my paint job, but the, the nicer one, the, the one that looks professional with the saber that was painted by Bob Fry. He's a commission painter on Instagram. He also did my Corsairs, uh, I still paint most of my own models, but um, but every now I have kids now, so you know I, I, every every now and then I get some help. And Bob is Bob is amazing. I'll link his Instagram account in the video description. Okay, so the last war gear option to consider is the Shimmer Shield, which for five points gives the Exarch that four up invuln save that I mentioned before. If when you finish building your list, you have five points left over, this is a really good way to use them. It's much better than giving a Farseer or a Warlock, you know, a Singing Spear instead of a Witch Blade, because what am I going to do with five points or seven points or whatever? Uh, with four wounds at T4 and minus one to hit, your Gallant Cavalry Commander can make way better use of an improved invulnerable save than can any other squad level commander available to craft worlds. Uh, but it isn't compulsory if your list is short on points, as the whole unit is likely to be wiped out regardless after a single round of combat, at least in uh, higher levels of play. Not not always, but that's something to expect. To sum up, in terms of builds, I suggest running spears in squads of three with an upgraded Exarch. I like either the Paragon Saber with Heart Strike or a Lance build with Expert Lancers. Uh, either the either lance is fine, but if you can afford it, the strength aid is obviously better. It increases the threat profile of the unit. I think you should definitely take the cannon over the catapults, and the shimmer shield is a definite nice to have in any build, but not a have to have. Whether the saber or the lance is the better pick probably actually depends on your meta. If most of your opponents are running lists composed of two wound infantry, like Marines or Chaos Marines, you want the Lance. If you're coming up against more Harlequins and Sisters of Battle, the Saber is better. If you only own one unit of Spears and modeled the Exarch with the weapon that you thought looked cooler, the decision is made, and the good news is you could not have made a wrong one. They are both good. Oh, uh, last there's one more build thing. Um, we should mention Relics of the Shrines. So there's a 1CP stratagem called Relics of the Shrines that lets you give two of your Exarchs an upgrade of some sort, but there's only one option available for each aspect shrine, and you can never take it twice. If you had two units of the same aspect, you couldn't do it. So the Shining Spear version is called Kane's Lance, which you can take on the guy with the Paragon Saber, so nothing preventing you. It doesn't say replaces the lance. When this unit charges, you roll a single die, and on a four plus, the target takes D3 immortal wounds and cannot fight until all other eligible units have done so. This is pretty good but I would not take the stratagem specifically to gain access to it because a four up is, that's, you know, 50-50. Uh, if you're already paying the CP so that you can give your Banshees the Crone Scream, which does that for Banshees on a two up and they already inflict fight last, then Kane's Lance is a solid second option. But I generally think the best combo for Relics of the Shrines is Crone Scream on the Banshees and Phoenix Bloom on Swooping Hawks, which gives them a five up feel no pain. So I would only take Kane's Lance if you have one but not both of those other units in your list and you you want to do something with the other half of what you get for paying that one cp in which case Kane's lance is pretty good okay tactics on the table as i said at the beginning of the video spears are, tar are a target elimination unit and they're generally either trading for something more valuable or used to exploit weaknesses in your opponent's defenses by rolling a flank 
which means just totally bulldozing the units on in one part of the board on one side of your opponent's army uh picking off a unit in your opponent's backfield to allow deep strikers in or perhaps to flip a backfield objective uh, and to force units that were in the midfield to pull back to deal with that threat, which then gives you an additional control in the middle of the board, which can be helpful for scoring and other things. Uh, against highly skilled opponents, your elite elf cavalry will rarely survive to make a second kill. So the single most important tactical principle of using spears well is knowing when to hold them back and when to commit them to a glorious charge. In games where you can wipe out a unit with your spears and have them live to fight for one or more subsequent turns, they are likely to end up being MVPs of the match. But even in games where they're a one and done, they will usually earn their points and then some, which is why I think they, they are a competitive unit. They do make the grade for competitive play. Recognizing when you can make multiple kills with your spears comes down to knowing the threat range of your opponent's units and realizing when she is spread too thin. So spears excel at killing unsupported enemy units sent off to pick up a distant objective or score a secondary or threaten one of your own scoring units in some remote part of the board. And if your opponent sends a unit of inf infantry to squat on some like out of line of sight objective on turn two, then you might be able to move your spears 16 inches, shoot something with at least the catapults, and then complete a charge using a fate die to ensure success and wipe out that unit without any serious counter threat to the spears and then get to use them again. If you do this though, just be sure to know how fast your opponent's units can be, especially the melee units, before committing your spears to killing something that is not of equivalent tactical value if you don't want to make a trade. Uh, because you don't want to get to, to do that and then get caught flat-footed. Actually, she was just tempting you out. She has something really fast that can get there and, and pick up the spears and it's a bad trade. So just be careful. Also, sometimes in combination with other fast units or deep strikers, your spears can be part of a slightly larger battle force that picks up several units at once on your opponent's flank. And then that swings the whole game in your favor uh, because now you have a numerical advantage and you have position. That said, Highly skilled players are unlikely to expose themselves to either of those tactics. Those are the kinds of things that can work really well in sort of mid-level play, um, certainly in narrative casual play, but against really skilled veteran players, uh, your spears are almost always going to make a trade in the early or the mid game, or occasionally they hang around to be a sweep and score unit in the final turns, and that's not bad either. That can be really good. So I've explained trading in other videos, and I imagine most of you already have a good handle on it. The concept is straightforward and enough. You use your spears to blast a key enemy unit off the board, knowing full well that your opponent will be able to kill the spears on her turn. In some cases, you might trade your spears for one of your opponent's target elimination units that are particularly dangerous to space elves. I like prioritizing wiping out my opponent's fast attack units, as elves can outmaneuver most enemies once you eliminate the handful of tools quick enough to counter our hawks or like duck and cover battle focused dire avengers or shroud runners or whatever it is. Even if the unit you pick up isn't quite as expensive as the spears, if that unit is essential to your opponent's battle plan, because that's like what they have against Eldar, uh, it's probably worth doing. In some cases, you might even be able to make it a two-for-one trade. Ooh, this is sophisticated. By using your spears to kill something in melee, and then the enemy moves in and, and kills the spears, but has to move into open ground to either charge them or shoot them. And then on your turn, you shoot that enemy squad off the board with a combination of battle focus and maybe fire and fade. Uh, and then you've performed a, a two-for-one trade. And if you can perform a couple of those two-for-one trades, you should find yourself with a significant enough resource advantage that your opponent by turn four or five is really struggling to keep up with you. That's a pretty effective way to play craft worlds is trading with occasional highly advantageous trades. Occasionally, you might want to trade your spears for something less valuable simply to limit your opponent's ability to score uh, primary objectives over multiple turns. So like maybe your opponent deep uh, like advanced deploys a squad into a quadrant of the board where there's a hard to reach objective and it's like away from the battle out of line of sight and they have something squatting on it um and you can kill that like turn two with your spears before if you're first player before they score uh and you know your spears will be shot off the board if they don't really have anything that can get back over to to retake that objective effectively um even if it's a, a points loss, that's probably worth doing. That could be a big VP swing for you at the end of the game. That's, that's a pretty sophisticated consideration. Newer players are probably better off focusing on 
more conventional trading, but that is a kind of trade that absolutely makes sense uh, in competitive play. In order to pull off these sorts of exchanges, you need to be able to predict where your opponent's units are going to be or can be and position your spears accordingly. Uh, generally, what you want is to have your spears as far forward as possible while remaining both out of line of sight and out of range of enemy units because they're just not like charging enemy units. Your spears just aren't that durable. I usually keep mine uh, towards the front of my deployment zone behind cover or similarly out of line of sight in the midboard. On maps with that quadrant deployment I was mentioning a moment ago, you can sometimes zip them over onto an opponent's flank if she has most of her units on one side of the board and just be absolutely sure that you keep your head down. Um, but but that can be a really useful place to have your, your spears until they're ready to make their move. Uh, if you do have to push them forward in, into the, like an uncontested quadrant or you choose to, don't forget about deep strikers, right? You have to screen out deep strikers because... Um, if they come in nine inches from you and just pick up your spears and you have no way to even retaliate, that's a that's a, that's a pretty brutal loss. In some matches, you might find yourself holding your spears back until the late game if no viable trading options present themselves, and that is totally fine. If this happens, you can use your spears to punch into your opponent's backfield on turns four and five and sweep in clear objectives, picking up stuff like Chaos Cultists. This works especially well if you went second as the second player scores primary objectives at the end of turn five instead of the command phase during the bat that battle round. So Craft World's players usually do most of their primary objective scoring in the late game. We're not durable, so like running onto objectives and taking fire uh, is not a strength. We have a few units that can do it. Um, but oftentimes you're, you're hoping to pick up 12 points, ideally on both of the final turns, certainly on turn five if you're player two. And doing so requires you to still have some fast units on the board when not a whole else remains. And spears fit that niche nicely. Lastly, spears are arguably the single best unit, lastly for this part of the video, uh, the single best unit for creating flexibility to score Wrath of Cain which is the secondary objective that gives you one VP if at the end of your turn your Aspect Warrior has eliminated at least one enemy unit, period, and four VP if you eliminated at least two enemy units, one in shooting and one in melee with two different Aspect squads. Because Spears are fast and dangerous in both phases, they act as like an insurance policy for Wrath and Cain, of Cain. So you can pivot into like melee killing or shooty killing. Um, that said, don't think that because you included Spears in your list that Wrath of Cain is necessarily a good idea. In most games, it is a trap. You should only pick the secondary if your opponent is running lots of aggressive minimum sized units that are going to put significant pressure on the midfield. If, if your opponent is running a trading game uh, with fragile minimum sized units, then Wrath of Cain every time. Good. Uh, to put it another way, Wrath is almost always a really good pick against Rakari and almost always a terrible pick against Custodes. Not that like Custodes are great right now, but um, durable units that hang back uh, or just armies where you're not going to be guaranteed to be making lots of kills with your Aspect Warriors. Uh, just, it, Wrath of Cain is very high risk. You can you can drop a lot of points gambling on it. So you got to be careful. Okay, this is where we talk about obstacles. In the case of spears, to be honest, the greatest obstacle to using them well is the sheer temptation that they present to newer players. The prospect of sending your biker cavalry tearing across open ground on turn one to slam into a vulnerable unit of Monkai upstarts is often simply too much for a fledgling autark to resist. Unfortunately, that particular tactic is uh, almost always terrible. Spears are expensive enough and fragile enough that throwing them out in front of your army to perform a glorious turn one charge is often not a good use of resources. So don't do that. Instead, as we discussed earlier, set up out of line of sight and wait for the right opportunity. Occasionally, this will be on turn one, but um, generally generally not. Uh, unless your opponent makes a big player, um, that, that can happen. Another challenge you may face is that uh, spears like Banshees don't do well when receiving charges. And even though they're really quick, they, you know, they, they set up for the charge. They have to hang themselves out there a little bit. Uh, for one thing, they just aren't durable enough to stand up to a round of punishment from a dedicated melee unit. And for another, even if one model does pull through to, to hit back, that remaining combatant is only at strength four because those spears don't get they don't have that elevated strength in melee when you didn't charge. They're just plus one when you don't charge. Uh, 
so they just don't fight as well. The only exception is the Exarch with the Paragon Saber who fights just as well in a sustained engagement as at the end of a heroic tilt into the enemy lines. But regardless, you want to be the one initiating the fight regardless of what loadout you know your, your Exarch has. So do not be afraid to ask your opponent questions like, how far does such and such a unit move? Do you have any stratagems or tricks that allow you to advance and charge or cover more than the ex expected amount of ground? It is absolutely reasonable and standard to expect opponents, even in tournaments, like serious tournament play, to answer those questions. Not answering those questions is, uh, even in the highest levels of play, just considered really bad sportsmanship. Um, it, should, it's not, it shouldn't be a got you game. It should be a tactics game. And if you just don't know what your opponent can do, then uh, you're, you know, it's not, it's just not as fun. It's, it's, it's more fun if we're, we're both making tactically informed decisions. On occasion, you might need to gamble on the possibility of your spears receiving a charge in order to position them effectively for your next play, uh, in which case it becomes all about risk management. So here's how I think of it. If your opponent has no bonuses, but some way to reroll, either the unit get, gets a free reroll or they can, they've got a CP or whatever, I would say that it is not unreasonable to set your bikes up even if they're vulnerable to an 11 or 12 inch charge in order to get them into position. Uh, even with a reroll hitting 11 and 12 is, is pretty hard. I think it's okay to gamble on that. At, at 10 inches, I think the risk is tolerable under the right circumstances, but anything closer than that, you really are playing with fire. Sometimes people think of a nine inch charge as like, a, oh, I'm nine inches away, they'll never get me. But honestly, with a reroll, the statistical probability of a nine inch charge is just not that low. Um, and so you, you, you need to not, you need to not gamble with, a, spears aren't, hyper expensive but at like 135 points that is not a unit that you want to just lose um worst case scenario when they succeed on a charge not only are your spears dead but now you've invited this problem unit maybe closer to your line it's like you gave them a free round of movement uh so you be careful it you don't have to keep them 100 percent safe this is a dice game after all but be thoughtful about the risks you're taking when you set your spears up because you do not want them if avoidable to get charged before they charge the other obstacle you might face to getting most the most out of your uh, Space Elf Lancers is that Spears cannot run straight through walls, and like Banshees can. And the fly keyword does not apply in the charge phase. Many casual players don't actually realize that the rule about fly is what it is, because it's totally counterintuitive narratively. Like, I fly all the time. Surely I also fly when I'm charging. But, but it's true. If you look at the core rules, you'll see that when measuring a charge over an obstacle, you need to measure as though your bikes were going straight up one side and straight down the other. Uh, this is this is a game balance thing. It's the same reason that five inch vertical engagement exists in melee. It's like it does it doesn't make sense narratively, but it's really important so that certain types of units are not um, overly privileged on the table. This can make it pretty difficult to get your aspect cavalry to reach targets behind line of sight blocking terrain which is usually the stuff that you, you want to get to um certainly it can be harder than it is for banshees who just run straight through it because it's breachable and they are infantry furthermore while banshees just shut down overwatch automatically spears don't which means you need to be mindful of the threat of high volume of fire or flamers or just like hot dice from enemies with powerful weapons um there are some other tricks for shutting down Overwatch, but generally the best standard way to work around it is to perform the charge from outside of line of sight. Uh, but of course, then Spears face the problem we just talked about with neither being able to breach nor fly in the charge phase. You can work around this a bit by using fate dice, right? Because uh, a fate die roll of two will let you auto set one of your two charge dice to a six and the psychic power ghost walk which gives plus two to charge, ensures that a unit of spears can't ever do worse than a nine inch charge. And if you keep a reroll in your back pocket also, um, that, that can be an insurance policy for when, when things go a little bit pear-shaped and you need to like make a longer charge around a terrain piece or something. Um, but a lot of the time, honestly, you might not need to worry a lot about Overwatch because after your spears like soften up the target, if, if you fly over the thing in the movement phase, land like three inches from the target, and soften them up with a round of shuriken catapult and shuriken cannon and lance fire, 
probably you don't really need to worry that much about whatever they have left for um, Overwatch. Nevertheless, I think the challenges that I just teased out with reference to getting around terrain and, and Overwatch uh, nudge into outline the single greatest obstacle to Spears finding a place in your list, and that is that Howling Banshees are so damn good and do just about the same thing. A single unit of Howling Banshees with an Exarch sporting Mere Swords and the Piercing Strikes upgrade puts out 22 attacks in melee. They're only strength four, but they get an automatic plus one to wound, so that makes them pretty equivalent to the Spears. Uh, 10 of those attacks are coming in at flat two damage minus three AP. The others are coming in at one damage minus four AP. Uh, and the Spears, although they're all minus four, strength six with some eights, maybe flat two, are only putting out 11 attacks in melee. So you have 10 flat two damage attacks and 12 one damage attacks versus 11 flat two damage attacks. That said, if the Spears are positioned to also use their full shooting profile, which I just talked about with the Overwatch thing, including the, the shooting attacks from the Lances in combination with the Shuriken Fire, they do hit harder than the Banshees overall. Uh, spears are also more maneuverable than Banshees on turns in which, in, in only on turns in which neither actually charges because the Spears can move 16 inches and advance 22, while Banshees move eight and advance normally. Uh, so eight plus D6. On the other hand, Banshees can advance and charge, which means that if you have a Fate Dice for advancing, a one, um, and Banshees are already a little bit faster than regular Elves, uh, if Banshees jump out of a transport three inches, they have a, a reliable 17-inch move to a Spear's 16-inch move uh, before they start their final charge run, and they can run straight through walls. So when it comes to charging, Banshees are faster, and they shut down Overwatch. On the other hand, Spears don't need a transport to get around. Banshees don't necessarily either, but often we put them in a transport. And Spears are also just straight up more durable, if slightly more expensive. All things weighed, in my opinion, the takeaway is this. If you are going to include only a single fast melee trading unit in your army, the Banshees with Mirror Swords and Piercing Strike are a little bit more competitive for their points. However, you can only have one unit of Banshees with a particular Exarch power. And if you are including more than one fast attack melee trading unit, your best option after that initial unit of Screaming Murder Elves is probably a unit of Spears with either Expert Lancers or an Exarch with a Paragon Saber and Heart Strike and a list with three such units. You could even have both, right? In most cases, I think that's overkill. I, I think that rarely are you going to want to run more than one unit of Spears. But two units of Spears and some Banshees, that's not... That's not a bad decision. That's not a. It's not like that's a, suddenly a narrative build at all. That is incredibly good. Um, running three units of spears, uh, I don't. I don't see that ever being a thing. I think six spears probably is the most we would see in a in a competitive list the way things stand now. Okay. Before we wrap up here, I will mention a few other combos, tricks, and concerns, and then I'll talk about that Vox Link thing I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So. Uh, although Spears are efficient enough for their points that they're a competitive include in a list from any sub-faction, they do deserve extra consideration in lists running Hail of Doom, a custom trait which makes your Shuriken fire even better. Uh, a custom list running Vengeful, which gives Exploding Sixes in Melee. Whew, Banshees and Spears with Exploding Sixes in Melee are vicious. Uh, Swift Strikers which allows Spears to make a 22-inch move, shoot something, and then battle focus out of line of sight, which is also good for the new behind enemy lines rules. Like, maybe in such a list, um, you would be doing that thing. You still could use the cannons instead of the catapults because with Swift Strikers, the heavy keyword doesn't matter. You could still battle focus them. In a built hand list, you have access to a stratagem giving Spears exploding sixes in a shooting or fight phase, or you could pay two CP and have it in both. Um, same Han Spears, as I mentioned earlier, have access to a stratagem that allows them to advance and charge. And while you should definitely be running Spears, if you were running Sam Han, faster Spears is not a reason to run Sam Han. As far as I know, no Wild Rider list has ever finished in the top eight of a GT since the Codex dropped. And if so, I'm going to say it was like a just enough people to be a GT in the 
month after the codex dropped in like Argentina or something. I, this is just not a thing. It's the, by far the least competitive craft world sub faction, despite being the poster elves for the ninth edition codex. Uh, sorry, Sam Han players. I, my heart goes out to you. Other stuff. Don't forget you can use phantasm to pick up your spears and put them into reserves for free before the game begins or to move them to the other side of the battlefield to like fake somebody out. Um, if you do put them into reserves, when you bring spears back onto the table, you can use ghost walk in conjunction with a fate die to guarantee that the nine inch charge succeeds. That said, generally speaking, I really think you're better off just keeping your spears on the table. It's too easy for highly skilled players to use screening units to dictate where spears can come back in out of reserve such that they just really aren't much of a threat. So most of the time, I think that's probably not the move. Uh, Lastly, psychic powers like Empower, Enhance, Guide, Doom can all significantly increase the damage output of your spears, especially Guide, as it works on both the shooting phase and the melee phase, and they play in both. Uh, that said, now that Warlocks are more expensive, it can be pretty difficult to fit Enhance and Empower into a list. It was hard before, now it's really hard, but they do remain solid picks for lists with enough melee options to make use of them. Enhance is better in a list with banshees which is going to be like every list because you can use the power on either unit uh banshees already get a native plus one to wound on the charge so they really can't make good use of empower almost ever um spears can uh but you also don't need psychic upgrades in order for your spears to be really good and and earn their points it's just a good resource to be aware of okay so that's what i've got uh, Shining Spears are a finesse trading unit that in the hands of a skilled player are as tactically effective as they are aesthetically awesome. And although they can be challenging for newbie autarchs, with proper restraint, they are a valuable asset in any list. If you have your own ideas about how best to use Spears, or you just want to leave a hello to help the algorithm, I hope you will do so in the comments below. Uh, before signing off, I just want to mention this VoxLink thing that I touched on at the beginning of the video. So it's a free app. It's dropping in February. It lets 40K players find other local players, either at home or while they're traveling in order to set up games outside of our own club. And I'm pretty excited about this because I've like been wondering for years why it doesn't exist already. But the only way that it's going to succeed is if enough of us sign up when it drops that it's actually effective, right? Because there has to be a big enough pool of players that we can actually use it. So whenever it becomes a thing, I'm going to do a three minute video just saying, hey, 40K people, let's try to make this thing work because wouldn't it be awesome if we had it? Um, so I'll, I'll remind you next month when, when it's really a thing. But I had to, I had to mention it. Uh, incidentally, if you are interested in obtaining early access to my content or accessing the private Eldari Discord peopled with my friendly patrons, I hope you might consider signing up to support my content. Uh, the basic level is only three bucks per month. And in addition to these other benefits, you can download most of the audio content like you would a podcast and listen to it uh, more easily. And if you're already a patron, you have my sincere gratitude. I look forward to talking to you all again soon. And until then, best wishes in your next campaign.